Okay, so we move back to thinking about futurism. Uh, I've been taking it rather leisurely at the beginning. We'll probably build up a bit more speed as we go go and go on. You know, I'm assuming you have time to read a bit more the background to this period over the weeks. There are no set readings, but I'm assuming that you are going to read about this period. Um, so we carry on looking at futurism. Remember I decided to, in this case, uh, to break it down in terms of themes that the artists were dealing with. The first theme we looked at was movement or dynamism. We're in the middle of the second theme, which is the city. The third theme will be subjectivity. And the, the last theme will be violence. Uh, they kind of overlap one with another. There are a lot of artworks that could go in more than one category, but for the sake of presentation, it's sort of helpful to 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 do this. Um, so, yeah, this is one of the works we were looking at under the theme of the city last week, Boccioni, The City Rises. So the city has something dynamic. You know, we're talking about their interest in movement, in dynamism. The city itself is seen as something in transformation, as indeed it was at that time. You know, maybe in Asia we're used to the idea of seeing construction cranes all over the place and the sound of demolition as well. You know, the city is something constantly in transit. If you go away for three years to study overseas, three or four years, and then you come back to Hong Kong, wow, I didn't know that, was, that wasn't there before. You know, it's always sort of changing very fast. Uh, but that, you know, that's the modern city. It's not the way the city was in uh, the Renaissance period, perhaps, or some, some other earlier times, not to the same degree. So uh, a big part of, of futurism is about how to develop a, a visual language appropriate for modern experience. And uh, one thing I was emphasizing last time was two phases in futurist work. There's the phase before and after they discover cubism. So this is an example of before in Boccioni's case and this is an example after. You can see that kind of fragmented, planar, more geometricized vocabulary which is something that has come from cubism. The introduction of the idea of multiple viewpoints within the same image. It has an effect of sort of bringing you closer to the, to the scene. Uh, even in this work, Boccioni has tried to find ways to bring you closer by putting us down in the, the depression of the construction site. But here we're, we're, we're drawn in even in a, a, a more extreme way, perhaps. So form and content, how does a style enable a possibility of vision that wasn't there before, that's appropriate to your subject matter, appropriate to the time in which you're living? Older art just doesn't see, older ways of making art just don't seem to work for the modern experience. Uh, Bala, we looked at, and you know, this is one of his quite early works. And we see how more traditional realist modes of image making don't really work. Perhaps this is interesting when we look at the Workman's Day, we saw how a sort of breakdown, he's right at the edge of what an older, more realist. Motion, notion of painting making can do. He's got to try and show us different times of the day, different moments in the building's construction, try to emphasize change. But he doesn't quite want to abandon the, 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 you know, the, the rules of realist painting. So he sort of fragments the different times of day within, within frames, carefully sutures them off. This is way, way before cubism and the language that gave for bringing different viewpoints together within the same frame. Here he's not quite ready to give up that unity of time and space that painting from the Renaissance had. You know, from, from, mor from morning to maybe morning, noonday, having your sandwich lunch time, and then the evening the workers have all gone home, you know, the dynamism, the passage of time. Uh, Bala. Um, yeah, the the street lamp. You know, this is how he's changed between 1904 to seven. That that last one, the Workers' Day, to 1909, the street lamp. Actually, the this is still before Q 
cubism in his development. Maybe the impact of cubism on futurism occurs about 1911, something like that. Uh, he, um, where, but cubism itself had started, you could say, notionally in 1907 with uh, Picasso's Demoiselle d'Avignon, um, the young ladies of Avignon. So perhaps the artist that was most influential on them before Cubism had been Seurat, the neo-impressionist or pointerless painter who used little dots of pure colour which were intended to meet in the eye, eye and produce a greater sense of visual vibrancy. Uh, and, and that influence often came via those Italian artists like Segantini who had been influenced by him. So even in a work like this, the street lamp, the, all this kind of fragmented touches of, of colour to represent the effulgence, the glow of the electric street lamp, all that is sort of traceable back ultimately to the, the language of Surah. But whereas, at least in theory, in Seurat's paintings, those dots were meant to merge in the eye. Instead of mer mixing your colour on the palette, they merge in the eye. Uh, to, uh, in fact, they start to say, stay separate, you know, and you, they become visual ticks or elements in their own right, give a greater sense of dynamism, as if light is moving out. So. It's still a realistic image, but it's a realistic image of something that's on the verge of being impossible to paint realistically. Uh, a, a, a night scene of a, a lamp, you know, how do you capture that just by painting it? You, you know, it's almost as difficult as painting the sun. You can't paint the sun, but how do you paint? Uh, you, there, there are no photons. You know, the photons coming out of a, a, a light, actual energy coming out. How do you represent that in mere pigment you know there's a gap between art and its and life there so some kind of more abstracted way is almost the only way you have to represent uh, a sense of energy and it's important to note that it, uh, there's a representation of moonlight moonlight is not the first thing you notice but eventually you do see ah there's a crescent moon here so natural light and artificial light are put together within the painting and what is more prominent it's the man-made light is more prominent uh, in, and there's a statement in that really that you know modernity man taking control uh, man the man-made night is more powerful you know this is a big actually a big social transformation when the city was lighted at night you know before that time People just went to sleep when it got dark. You know, unless you were rich, you could afford to have lots of candles or something, but most people couldn't, except for special occasions. You just went to sleep, and then you got up when it, when the sun came up. You know, that was the rhythm of uh, agricultural life, basically. Uh, so the whole of modern life is very different now because we can go out in the evening. Nobody went out in the evening. You, there were robbers. You get could get killed even you know in the dark you know who, who knows what's going on it's but with electric light uh, gas light and then electric light you know this is all modernity um, electric light uh, it's tied to the hydroelectric power that Italy had from the alpine um, uh, environment of the north of its country which is important part of its industrial uh, urban trans and urban transformation so it's symbolic in a broader way of the pa you know how electricity is transforming modern life from a world of horsepower which you know still has its traces in a painting like this and you know, they're building this modern city using the power of horses uh, we're, we're rapidly moving from horsepower or steam power to uh, uh, the, you know, the century of electricity and all that comes from that. I should maybe read you what Bala himself says about the painting. It's, um, you know, when they, when they exhibited their works in Paris, then there was an opportunity for them to write uh, about their work. So we have some accounts, especially from that time, of different paintings by the artists themselves. 
But this is actually a, a retrospective account, I think. So Bala says, this painting, as well as being original and a work of art, is also scientific, because I try to represent light by separating the colours of which it is composed. It is of great historical interest, both for its technique and for its subject. No one at that date, 1909 that is, thought that a banal electric light could be a motif for pictorial inspiration. On the contrary, for me, there was a subject in it, and it was the attempt to represent light, and above all, to show that romantic moonlight had been superseded by the light of the modern electric bulb. That is, the end of romanticism in art. From my painting comes the phrase, let's kill the moonlight. Now that phrase was used by Marinetti in his uh, Futurist Marinetti, uh, Manifesto. So, you know, obviously moonlight is especially associated with romantic art. You know, there's plenty of romantic paintings and po poetry that uh, talk about the moon. And even in modern romantic songs or whatever, the moon is a, a, a big motif. But, um, yeah, the moon is eclipsed, if you like, by man-made light. Oh, here's a detail to show the brushstroke, how it's made up. And, yeah, even working in Paris, we, we saw how Severini uh, was uh, influenced by Seurat's pointillist, visionist style. Uh, then he goes on to have his encounter with Cubism too, although in his case, you know, there, there is the geometricized, fragmented planes of everything, but it's not quite so dynamic, at least here, uh, not so concerned to fetishize mo modern transformation. It's the modern city, but uh, it's not so concerned with, uh, um, you know, the the real cutting edge of dynamism and machinery and so forth that some other futurist artists are concerned with. Okay, so now we're moving into new territories, things we didn't see last week. Um, Carlo Calla, actually I haven't really introduced him before, he's the, one of the main uh, futurist artists that we haven't talked about so far, leaving the theatre 1910 to 11. See, it's an, a pre-Cubist work. I think by now you should be starting to get a sense of what are the pre- and post-Cubist works of Futurism. None of that geometric vocabulary. But there's a certain kind of destabilization of the, the viewpoint. You know, there's just the floor, the, you know, the diagonal angle at which the figures seem to be walking. We're, we're sort of destabilized our viewpoint a little bit. The sense of the crowd, you know, being in a crowd in a modern city. This is a modern experience. You know, people living in villages never had that kind of experience of being up close to strangers. You know, in the village you knew everyone, you grew up with everyone. In the city, not only are they people you don't know, but they're right up next to you. You know, we have that experience ourselves, you know, being crushed next to a complete stranger on the MTR or something like that. You know, someone you've never seen before and you'll never see again. Uh, that's a funny kind of modern experience that people n never had in other times, you know. Again, it's a pre-Cubist example. Milan Railway Station, 1909 to 10. Well, the, the, the steam engine, uh, it, it both powered industry and uh, therefore mo the modern transformation in that sense, but it also powered uh, steam trains and therefore modern communication. I think we have a little sense of that from our own time of how, uh, you know, say with the high-speed rail network in China, you know, how that sort of shrunk the country for people who can't afford uh, air travel suddenly you know you can you can go back over Chinese New Year much more easily to over long distances and things like that somehow the country seems smaller so so when the railways first were built in the mid 19th century onwards that there's a similar kind of massive transformation of lived experience people are moving rapidly through a landscape that they've never they've never passed through it more than the pace of a horse you know a horse trotting before suddenly they're, they're, they're moving really, really fast. It's a new mode of vision 
you know how how can the more static modes of art making inherited from the Renaissance deal with that? Whole new experiences. Of course, there's airplanes too. You, uh, the aerial viewpoint is a modern viewpoint. Whoever had an aerial viewpoint before, maybe um, Ambrogio Lorenzetti can make a painting from the, uh, the, the, uh, of Siena, you know, Siena in the center of it, the, the city, it's on a hill, and the top of the uh, the, the the town hall there's a tall tower and if you stand at the top of it yeah you can look down on the landscape around and maybe that influenced how he painted the landscape but generally speaking you can't really have a, a top-down view the way you can from an aeroplane so all of this is modern experience and artists trying to grapple how to deal with it the railway is something uh, railway stations are a particular kind of building that interest uh, the futurists. Well, here's the transformation to a post-cubist work by Carla. You could see the difference, the abolition of Carla, because a lot of the cubism of Picasso and Braque, they play down Carla. Uh, in, uh, you get these sort of grays and olive tones, browns, olive green kind of tones. Um, color is not sort of central because they're more concerned with form than, than with color. They're not concerned with the expressive power of color, for instance. But whereas Picasso and Braque mostly dealt with portraits and still life, the world close at hand, Cara is quite happy to try and deal with a big public space. This is the Galleria in Milan. It's there still today. At that point in time, it was a modern structure. It would be like going to... Uh, you know, look at the interior of a recently built shopping mall in Hong Kong or something like that, uh, trying to, to represent a, a characteristically contemporary kind of space. It's a big covered arcade, let me show you. Uh, I'm sorry, it's a terrible photo, but you know, you see, even to try and represent the shape of it, it's like a cross shaped. Uh, design with this big dome in the middle. Even to represent it in a, a pho photograph, uh, photography is a sort of realist medium in its uh, uh, essence. Uh, it's a kind of machine for making Renaissance style perspective or images. But in order to capture the Galleria in the man in one photo, uh, rather than the sequence of photos, a fisheye lens basically has had to be used. So even photography has to, to use the technique of distortion to try and show what the gallery is like. So there's shops and cafes all the, uh, at the ga ground level and then there is this uh, dome in the center. So it's a little bit like a cross-shaped church or something like that you could say. And then the signage. C Cubists like to include lettering in their paintings so Carver has picked that up. Lettering helps bring us back to the flat surface, though less so here than in Picasso and Braque's work. And of course, the fragmented style helps to create a sense of the dynamism, the bustle of, of, uh, of the crowds. Maybe this is a, a human figure here, for instance. Say. So it's a modern sort of modern structure using um, metal and so forth. The, the, the dome of the, you know, it, it was a real landmark of the city. You could have, you could say. Rosolo. So also I'm introducing an artist that, that we didn't meet last week. The Solidity of Fog, 1912. This is the city at night. The mysterious quality of, you know, the boundaries are lost, you know. There's some suggestion he's even trying to do two things. One, talking about the modern city but also secondly to talk about some experience of Italian soldiers when they were on some uh, colonialist expedition uh, military expedition in in Africa a kind of double doubling of meaning um, and when we're talking about the theme of futurism and the city uh, an artist that 
well, a figure that really has to come to our attention, again, someone we didn't mention last week, <coughs> is Santalia. Uh, he's an architect. Uh, so someone who doesn't just attempt to represent the city, is actually attempting to intervene within the city itself. A futurist architect, but he died very young. You know, so many people of that generation died during the First World War. It was a, warfare too was becoming modern, and that meant mass death, you know, in a way that uh, tools of mass death were invented. Uh, this is the world we're still living in today, where the possibility of mass destruction or even the elimination of human life is all something we live with. That that well that that's a slightly later moment. That's a post forty five, post nineteen forty five experience, living in a world where human beings have atomic weapons and therefore the power to destroy themselves. That's a that's a, that's something that artists and everyone else started to ha have to come to terms with at that, that time. So uh, because uh, he died young, he, he didn't build that much, didn't really build anything of his great structures that he envisaged, uh, but also because some of them would probably have been pretty much unbuildable, even if you, in the technology of the time, even if you had uh, someone who's prepared to, to to build it for you. Remember, that's the difference between an architect and uh, a painter. You know, you could make all kinds of paintings that nobody likes, and you just store them in your bedroom or something, you know, and 50 years later, someone says, wow, you know, that's so great, you know. But uh, if you're an architect, you know, you're not going to be able to build. Sculptors could be somewhere in between, you know. The, the sculpture could make a little maquette of something <coughs> in plaster, but they, they, you know, you can't make the full-scale bronze. Uh, where would you store it? All that bronze would cost so much to cast. You know, you you can't do it. You know. So what we really have of Santalia is um, these kind of perspectival drawings. We don't even have. Uh, you know, detailed architectural plans and so forth to envisage how you would turn this into reality. Actually, maybe you couldn't at that point. But the interesting thing is uh, his uh, forward-thinking ideas now have become a reality that uh, we live in. Or, you know, his utopia of the, the future has become our slightly depressing contemporary reality, you could say. You know, it's... A, uh, there, there's something about, um, you know, we're talking, this course is called modernity and its discontents. You know, a lot of the artists we'll look at are really somewhat critical of modern life, you know, or at least certain aspects of it. And how I'm talking, I'm also embodying that kind of critical perspective, I suppose. But the future is for mostly cheerleaders for modernity. We see it all as a, a positive thing. And a lot of this art was made even before the slaughter of the First World War. So that was perhaps the first big interruption of uh, modernist uh, kind of dreaming of uh, how wonderful everything is. But there's something particularly about architecture. You know, you, how could you be a critical architect? Maybe it's not that easy. Architecture is almost has to believe in the future. Uh, if you didn't believe in the future, you wouldn't be building buildings. You know, why would you do it if you thought that the future is just a, a waste of time? You know, how can you be other than positive as an architecture mm -hmm. architect? You know, um, it's it's almost like a affirmative in its nature somehow. So here he is. So so I just choose uh, one. Uh, examples. Often the subjects of his architectural projects are particularly modern, you know, like power stations, railway stations. And it's usually not even individual buildings. It's more complexes, urban complexes. And that's something we, we, we perhaps even take for granted. Like he had the idea of a an airport and a railway station would be together the same building, you know. Wow, well, Hong Kong International Airport, you know, the Airport Express comes right into the airport. You just walk straight in. Maybe we take that for granted, you know, even in other contemporary airports, you don't have that immediate access from air to, to, to rail. 
but certainly in the early part of the 19th century, the whole idea of air travel would have been a pretty new idea anyway, let alone trying to integrate things like that. Um, oh, here's an example of him talking. He says, we no longer feel ourselves to be the men of the cathedrals, the palaces, and the podiums. We are the men of the great hotels, the railway stations, the immense streets, colossal ports, covered markets, luminous arcades, straight roads and beneficial demolitions. You know, all things, let's get rid of them. You know, the future is where, where it's all at. Uh, sometimes this kind of stepped back look you get, you know, it likes that. We, ah, there are buildings in Hong Kong that are like that sort of step pyramid structure, you know, in the Bloomsbury Center in London would be another example. Um, he often doesn't suggest having any decoration applied to the surface, just pure forms, or leave the materials themselves bare. Or if it's color, it should be brightly colored. Uh, he's thinking about ha houses as like machines, you know, like a sort of building is like a uh, like in a factory. He says uh, uh, the house is like a gigantic machine. He says it's a little bit similar to what another architect, Le Corbusier, talks about a home as a, a machine for living in. You know, mechanical metaphors. He had the idea of lifts, elevators going up the outside of a building. He says. <laughs> like uh, to, they should swarm up the facades like serpents of glass and iron. Well, we have that, you know, bubble lifts or external lifts are part of our contemporary reality, but uh, that was just a technologically uh, improbable idea at that time. Anyway, very dynamic shapes, not static shapes. Um, multi-level urban complexes. He describes the futurist city uh, in, in a manifesto as being an immense and tumultuous shipyard, agile, mobile and dynamic in every detail. The street will no longer be like a doormat at ground level, but will plunge many stories down into the earth and will be linked up for necessary interconnections by metal gangways and swiftly moving pavements. Mm. Yeah, again, we, we have all that stuff now, but <laughs> that has taken a while for it to happen. And someone has to be the first person to envisage all this thing. So it's, it's even a kind of norm in Hong Kong that you have podiums above ground level, you know, even in the older housing estates like Meifu, you get that kind of idea. Um, just looking at, uh, I think this, this is not uh, someone who themselves is a futurist, but uh, looking at the influence of futurism on architecture. And this is part of a, a broader story about the influence of modern painting and sculpture on architecture. A lot of, there's a lot of influence, you know. Uh, it's one of the ways in which modern art has influenced the, the modern world through its influence on architecture. And sometimes the very people who are making modern art become architects, like Le Corbusier himself started off as a, a, as a purist painter, then he becomes an architect. So a lot of ideas start in, in art and then move to architecture. Partly because it's a freer realm, you know, you, you don't, the, the question of necessity and patronage doesn't get in your way, so you can dream as you want to dream. Uh, so, for example, in the Dutch Die Stiel group, you know, painters like Van Doesburg or Mondrian, they develop a certain kind of language, and then later that language gets <coughs> translated to be the language of architecture and design. Um, so. That's a broader story, but within the case of futurism, here's one example of a building that seems to embody certain kind of futurist qualities of, of dynamic and organic form. This is by the architect Mendelssohn, his Einstein Tower built in Potsdam, 1920. It doesn't exist anymore. 
it's an got an observatory on the top. It's like a, 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 and I think it's influenced by things like this. We were looking at it last week, Boccioni's still life sculpture, the opening up of forms, the turning of forms into very making static things very dynamic. All this, I think, it's hard to imagine this kind of architecture unless you had those kind of paintings and sculptures already a few years earlier. Or if we take it all into its very sculpted kind of architecture. Or to take it more close to our time, this is the Frank Gehry's uh, Bilbao Guggenheim with these very kind of dynamic sculptural forms. You know, this is very, it's all, I mean, some people would even criticize an architect like this by saying, well, you're just kind of making sculpture, really. It's not really, you know, you're just sort of blowing, blowing up sculpture rather than thinking about architectural form in terms of what was really useful. But hey, it's an art gallery, you know, functionality fu is a different issue when you're talking about an art gallery than if you're trying to build a factory building or something like that, Some something that's more narrowly function functional you know an art gallery is aesthetics is is part of what its function is after all okay moving on to the next theme subjectivity maybe this is a theme that's particularly the prominent in the earlier phases of futurism before the impact of Cubism, um, and you can relate it in a broader sense to the trend of symbolist art in the late 19th century, early 20th century, which is concerned, art that's concerned with inner experience rather than with external reality. Instead of working from nature, people are working from the imagination. So why can't subjective experiences be as valid a subject for art as objective reality and once you start you know that's leads to expressionism as well for instance you know if, and if you want to if your your idea is to express a certain emotion uh, maybe realism is not going to work for you. You, you know, there is if you want to to, to paint uh, if you want to draw an apple you can draw the outline of the apple that's fine uh, never mind apples don't have outlines that that's just an invention of draftsmanship, but you know you know what you're doing. But if you want to represent fear, how do you do that? Uh, there's no easy. You can't just sit a fear on a table and draw what it, what it looks like. <laughs> so your language is going to going to have to be different. So subjectivity and modernism seem to want to go together in a way. So we're back to Boccioni, and this is his states of mind. Actually, it's a series of work. There are three works, uh, and it's more complicated than that because there are two versions of the series of three works. So there's the states of mind one and the states of mind two. This is states of mind one. So this is those who stay. So there are three, three, three works, those who stay, those who go, and the farewells. So I'm not showing the whole series. You, could, um, you can easily find it all. So it's about departure, but not the externalities of, of showing people leaving, but the, more about what emotions would you feel and are, how are the emotions going to be different if you're the person going and you're the person staying. Uh, if you're a futurist, you probably think that going is a good thing. That you know, movement, motion, dynamism—that's all what life is, you know. And we, we we go with all that. So, being left behind is maybe the more negative uh, uh, position to be in of the two. That's just my um, uh, conjecture. You know, they don't actually say that. Um, so, yeah, you can imagine these are the people who are left behind after saying goodbye to people. The scene is set in a railway station. You know, it's a big place of arrivals and departures. 
see sort of ghost, almost wraith-like, ghost-like kind of figures of sadly moving off. You know, they're just sort of left behind. But it, uh, you know, we don't need more detail because it's not about what were they dressed in. That's not the question. It's more what were they feeling is the question. So it's about evoking rather than describing. I mean, this kind of idea that certain shapes and colors could evoke a certain emotional mood, we already find that in Surah, for instance. Surah tries to use lines in different directions to represent certain feelings. For example, he says, if horizontal lines predominate in an image, that would make it more restful. Mm -hmm. If there are lines springing upwards from the vertical, that creates a sense of joyfulness. If it's mostly lines going down, that creates a sense of sadness. He may or may not be right. It's a bit of a rigid kind of language he's proposing. But, yeah, the broader principle is true that s different things could evoke certain moods. So the colour and the shapes, you know, the here definitely predominant vertical lines and then these sort of slight wispy diagonals on top of it all. This is the second version he produced. And this, this is probably the best example we have, these two versions of um, the States of Mind series by Boccioni that can show us the before and after of discovering Cubism. So he comes back to exactly the same theme, but in a vocabulary that's indebted to Cubism. You know, you see the sort of grey tonality and the more fragmented, plainer quality. There's still that kind of verticality of everything. Yeah. Um, we have a bit more detail in a way, sorry, a bit more detail of, say, how they're dressed. Even though there's the fragmentation of the figures, helps to convey a sense of their motion. You know, we see details of the, uh, the coats they're wearing, things like that. And I'll just show you one from the second series of The Farewells. So here we see a railway engine, you know, in, the, in that era, a railway station is full of smoke and steam. You know, that's the, the nature of it all. And then the swirls representing the figures in motion, bustle of a, of a crowd. In Cubist art, often you have letters or numbers, stencil, that help to reaffirm the two-dimensional surface of the painting, mm -hmm. help to make two-dimensional design work, abolish perspectival space. So here is Boccioni getting up to date with what the French have done, but using it for his own uh, personal ends. Here's uh, Bocciani talking about, uh, actually, those who stay. He says, those who stay, perpendiculars indicate their depressed condition and their infinite sadness, dragging everything towards the earth. The mathematically spiritualized silhouette, don't, don't ask me what that means, Render the distressing melancholy of the souls of those who are left behind. I think it, it means it, it's sort of de disembodied, the kind of silhouette. And he's making, um, uh, he, he makes a kind of musical analogy, which is very common in the art of this time. People, Artists of, visual artists of this time are thinking very much about music as a kind of art form that is in, they aspire to in some way. The English art theorist Pater talks about art aspiring to the condition of music. So here uh, is Boccioni talking about this series. He says, in the midst of the confusion of departure, the mingled concrete and abstract sensations are translated into force lines and rhythms in quasi-musical harmony. Mark the undulating line and the chords made up of the combination of figures and objects. 
One thing that uh, is really important uh, for Boccioni and I think other futurists too is the philosophy of Henri Bergson. Bergson was really very popular at that time uh, and his approach to things is to emphasize the subjective or you could say the phenomenological experience of things. For example, he and Einstein had a big conversation once about time, you know. Um, his idea, Bergson's idea is that how we experience time is nothing like the way scientists talk about time. You know, scientists often talk about time almost like it, as if it's a dimension, the same way as space, uh, spatial dimensions are. It's like just a fourth dimension. Uh, but hey, is that actually how we experience time? You know, we experience a sense of duration and time. It, we don't think think of time as just a bunch of static instants, any one of which could be isolated in order to do some mathematical work on it, calculus or whatever. We think of time as a, as a flow and then maybe memory comes into that for Bergson. He's very interested in memory, he makes distinctions between, um, he says there are two kinds of memory, you know, like if you, if you memorize the song, you can play that song, you can play that song because of memory but you're, you don't have a, a mental image of, of a, some time in the past, you know. But you could have a memory of a particular music lesson that you had with a particular teacher. You have a mental image of that. That's a different kind of memory. So he's very interested in all this sort of subjective experience. All of this kind of plays in, I think, is the intellectual climate that... Um, influence uh, this kind of work. Rousseau, going back to him, um, his painting music. Well, yeah, music, you know, it's a subjective I experience too. Um, how do you represent sound in a visual world? I've already talked about how, uh, just now, about how artists are interested in music as something that is um, in it as an abstract expressive landscape, a uh, language, you know, painters are obviously told, ah, oh, but your painting doesn't look like anything. But, you know, no one ever said that to Mozart. Oh, you know, it doesn't sound like anything. You know, in the real world, we hear people talking, we hear birds singing, but your music just is music, you know. Composers never had to, to face those kind of questions. It was, it was already a sort of more abstracted, pure language of feeling. So around this time there's this interest in the connections and the analogy between the two. Trying to represent something non-visual, again it's a subject experience, this experience of music, of sound in general. So he's trying to do it in terms of colour, trying to represent the kind of different musical forms evolving. It's a pre-cubist phase, it's not quite, it's part of the early uh, aspect of, of, of futurism. At the bottom you have the keyboard player and you have a sort of swirls of form. I imagine it like a bark fugue or something like that, you know, it's interweaving forms of uh, music. He does actually other things too. He, he does one called perfume, where he tries to represent visually another of the five senses. He himself is actually uh, a musician. So he, he makes um, machines for making noise. You know, his uh, concern with modernity means that he's not just interested in musical notes, he's interested in all sounds and uh, the sounds of the city, particularly modern kinds of sounds, you know, writing a piece of music for the whistles of factory chimneys and things like that. Uh, he wrote his own manifesto called The Art of Noise, actually kind of influential on some later composers like 
John Cage, the American composer, who tries to say, well, let's concern ourselves with all the sounds there are, not just the ones that can be produced by pianos and violins and so forth. Um, yeah, the, this theme of the interest in different uh, sensory modalities, sound, I mentioned perfume. Uh, Marinetti, the poet who was the sort of founder of Cubism, uh, of Futurism, he's also interested in, uh, he published a Futurist cookbook, so he's interested in taste uh, and how you'd explore that in a Futurist way. He, for instance, he made meat sculptures, food to look at rather than to eat. So, well, sight come, comes in there. He didn't like, you know, we, when we think stereotypically about Italian cuisine, the first thing probably you think of is pasta. Well, he didn't like pasta. He said, pasta makes you tired and depressed. Uh, so it's not a kind of modern, um, a modern kind of food. Uh, or he'd suggest not, no knives and forks. Just use your hands or dip your head into the food and <laughs> eat, you know. Mixing raw and cooked food together. It's actually a very avant-garde approach to cooking. Here's one of his uh, dishes um, called aerial food. It's, it's a kind of like signature of futurist dish. Uh, you have pieces of olive, fennel and kumquat, you know, like the little fruit you have at Chinese New Year on trees and you eat that with your right hand you know no knives and forks just your hand while your left hand caresses little pieces of different things sandpaper velvet and silk so touch comes into it and it's interesting how the touch might influence your tastes you know uh, at the same time the diner is blasted with a giant fan preferably he says an aeroplane propeller and waiters spray you with the scent of carnations, all to the sound of a Wagner opera. So, you know, this is a try to bring all the senses to play when you're eating and see how that affects things. Actually, there's an award winning cook called Heston Blumenthal, uh, a contemporary cook, and he does something similar. You know, I think there's some, I think it's a seafood dish, and you have the headphones to hear the sound of. Uh, the waves while you're eating that particular dish and things like that. So things that start off uh, as kind of crazy ideas can later become mainstream ideas. Let's take a, a short break there. Oh no, let, just let me finish one more work. Carlo Cara, The Metaphysical Muse, 1917. Actually at a certain point Cara becomes um, a sort of follower of the artist Di Chirico. We haven't met him, but we will later on, who paints the, uh, in a style very similar to this, strange objects gathered together, could be mathematical models to explain something, pictures within pictures, maps and so forth. You often have and strange dummy-like figures. Those are there in Di Chirico's work as well. Kara kind of falls in with him for a, for a, for a while. It's it's just evokes a strange sense of mood. It's hard to say what it is. It's like a strange storeroom with uh, unusual things all added together, and a slightly buckled perspective. It's all about some some subjective mood that's being evoked, rather than describing a particular. There's no thing happening. There's no narrative. And no particular reference to the modern world either. So it all fits with this theme of subjectivity. Let's just have a, a short break, toilet break if you like, or get a break to get your concentration back and then we'll come back to look at the last theme which is the theme of violence. <laughs> 